Ladies and gentlemen, once again, Jake, how's it going, man? Oh, it's doing good, man. How are you? I'm good. Uh, thanks for coming back on Dads with Mike's, man. I've been really excited to have you on again because we had such a con great conversation last time. And uh, we talked so much about different kinds of things related to marriage and all that fun stuff. And we went over an hour and then I was like, oh, man, this could have think this thing could have gone easily to two or three hours. So here we are. Part two with Jake. Uh, I'm so excited to have you on, man. Uh, what's been going on with you, man? How's it going? It's going great. I'm excited to be on here again. This is the, the, the most fun thing that I think we get to do with when we start doing things online is actually getting to talk about the things that we're we're passionate about. And, you know, there's been a lot that's going on since the last time I had come on. I feel like whenever I was on the last time, there was a lot of the things that were in the the talking phase that are now fully like finished products. And so I'm excited about that. One of the big things is I just recently released a a marriage course, which for me was something really important that I really wanted to be able to do back a little over a year ago when I first started. Um, earlier this month, my wife and I celebrated our 15th wedding anniversary. And That's Thank you. Thank you. And and kind of interesting with that here in August, it will officially be 20 years that we've been together in some fashion. And August is also my 39th birthday. And so I've now officially reached the point in my life where I've been with my wife longer than what the period of time in my life where I wasn't with her. And so, you know, there's just something about that just from a kind of a, a reflection standpoint that I felt like it was the right time to put something out there that hopefully could help other people, you know, learn from the really good things that we've been able to do over the years and also learn from our struggles and our, you know, you know, trial and errors that we've had. You know, I've been pretty open, you know, both with you the last time and also with uh, some of my writing on, on X about the challenges that we've gone through. You know, we were about three years ago at the, you know, the, the brink of divorce, really. And so to be able to not only come back from that, but to be able to really be thriving and, and doing well, I felt like we had a really interesting collection of, of stories and, you know, um, just lessons to share with people. And so it's officially out there. Um, people can grab the course now. Uh, we also started um, a marriage community where my wife and I are kind of co-running that, which is really exciting. So people can have the opportunity to join that and they can get day-to-day -day access to me and to my wife and troubleshoot ideas and go over all things, you know, marriage, whether that be. I'm looking forward to that one, uh, to be honest with you and uh, sorry to cut you off, but it's, it's no, just, you're good. It's uh, I'm really excited for that. And I'll tell you why it's because I, I've never seen anything like this before. I don't, I feel like we don't have these types of groups where couples can join together and then talk with other couples about relationship stuff and compare and maybe share ideas. And I like right. the way you have it set up too, is that you'll have like the, the husband section and the wives section and then the couple mm -hmm. section. So the, the dudes can talk amongst themselves and the wives can talk amongst themselves. And, and then you'll have the, the main group together. And I, I'm really excited for that because then we'll, we'll be able to share ideas with, uh, uh, other couples, uh, like, you know, like might be, might be going through the same thing as you, you know? So, uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to that one. And I have to say, I got your course myself and I was really interested in it. And what I really like about your course, man, is that I think it's for anybody. So you might think, you know, who might need a, a marriage course? You think maybe oh, a couple that's struggling. And for me, you know, I'm blessed. I can say that my marriage is going really well. Uh, it, it's look, it's, it's even more than that. It's it's amazing, I can say. So at first glance, you might think, well, no, this guy doesn't need it. He's not my crowd. But I got the course because I think that, I, and I'm always a strong believer of you can always do better. Okay, and let's not mm -hmm. get it to a point where you're so confident and then you start to slack off because of your confidence. So I didn't want to get there. So I got the course because I told myself, well, maybe there's some stuff in there that I never, you know, considered or thought about. And sure enough, there's some stuff in there that uh, we'll talk about later. But uh, I really liked how you split it into two main themes of intimacy and communication. Now, my first question to you is, 
why intimacy and communication? Are those to you the most important aspects of marriage? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Well, first of all, I think kind of going to your the first thing that you kind of mentioned there, when I created the course, that was kind of the idea is that whether it was somebody who had been married for 50 years or someone who hadn't has not even gotten married yet, maybe they're engaged and they're trying to kind of figure out what what they're about to embark upon. And I think that was the idea was to have it be something that anyone could give value from. And then when I started thinking about, OK, what exactly I'm going to put in this, you know, because I, I mean, 20 years together, 15 years of marriage is a long time and it could go a lot of different directions. For me, though, communication is kind of the foundation and that's where everything else sort of comes back to communication. So that was definitely something that I wanted to make sure was very heavily addressed within the course. Okay. And then the other one is intimacy, um, because I think so many people, if you were if you were to have them and if they were being honest and they had to pick one thing that maybe they were not completely satisfied with it just seems like time and time again the people that i talk with it always in some fashion comes back to intimacy whether that be you know physical intimacy the emotional intimacy um and i also even stumbled across um something called intellectual intimacy which originally i had never even really heard of that term but it was something that what once i that? started basically intellectual intimacy is where you know, your shared values match your interests, and it starts to create things that like you want to pursue and learn more about. So it could be things related to something that would help you for your job, or it could be things that are related to just things that you want to do outside of your job. Um, things like, for instance, there's a lot of people that want to maybe want to study stoicism. And so that's a very popular thing right now. Well, you know, if you if you and your spouse can share common interest in pursuing knowledge within the realm of stoicism then that's something that you can bond over as you're learning about this new thing together and so you're building an intellectual level of intimacy okay so that's it's kind of like if, uh, maybe if my wife and i start reading a book together we're both we both get a copy of the same book and start sharing ideas and thoughts kind of like a book club but between couples exactly it'd be a form of it Absolutely. And, you know, there's a lot of different things you could do even just within that. Like last year, um, my wife and I read a couple's devotional each night. And so, you know, we read it, we just, we would read the passage, talk about it. But then at the end, there, there was a list of like discussion questions. And so then it turns into these like deep, meaningful conversations where you kind of learn about each other and, and also kind of learn what the, you know, your spouse's ideas are on, the, and it could be any topic really, but you know, there's one thing that I've learned is that 20 years together, I still am continually learning new things about my wife and she's still continually learning new things about me. And so, you know, each time you do that, that's an opportunity to build connection and foster a certain level of intimacy. So let, let's get into that. The, the first theme of your course uh, is intimacy and mm -hmm. It's really interesting to me how a lot of guys seem to get it wrong, right? You hear, <laughs> what do you hear the most often? Uh, guys complaining about the lack of sex in their lives, mm -hmm. in their marriage, right? And the feedback that you hear from them is usually along the lines of, man, I, we're not doing it as much as I'd like to, right? So what's what's the number one misconception to you in terms of, how guys view intimacy well i think the really the the most common misconception that i've found is, and i was guilty of this too is that if my wife decides like in a given night that she doesn't want to have sex with me that that somehow means that you know she just she doesn't love me or she's not sexually attracted to me anymore or something along those lines when in reality the, the truth of the matter is, is that if your wife chooses not to have sex with you, or if she has like the classic, I have a headache that night, then, you know, it's a situation where something usually that the man could have done differently contributed to why she doesn't want to have sex that night. There's always gonna be times where maybe you have sick kids or, you know, you have to get up really early the next morning. 
So it's like tonight's just not a good night. That that those things do happen yeah. from time to time. But the majority of the time, if you do the things throughout the day outside of the bedroom, if you take care of those things as the husband, then you are drastically improving the chances that she's not going to have a headache whenever it comes time to go to bed. And that looks like a lot of different things that could mean, you know, sometimes something as simple as taking the kids away to giving her some space to be alone. It could be helping out with things around the house. You know, one of the most common comments I get on some of the things that I post online is, so what you're saying is you're trading chores for sex. And it's like, well, no, no, no. If that's what you're getting out of this, then you're getting it all wrong. It's not a matter of I'm trading these chores for sex. It's a matter of I'm going to be there to help serve my spouse because I'm wanting or expecting something to happen from an intimacy standpoint later. The fact of the matter is, is that, you know, if you and I was this guy. So, you know, I'm I'm talking to my former self as well. If you come home from work. And all you do is lay on the couch and watch TV, you know, watch the sports game and you get up and you go to the dinner table to have dinner and then you go hang out and play video games or, or, you know, whatever it is. And then you just magically expect that, that sex is going to happen that night that then you really don't understand how things work. Um, You know, for men, sex is a physical thing through and through, you know, we could be angry frustrated with work we could be angry frustrated with our wife we could be as mad as all get out with our wife 100 percent. if she gets naked right in front of us we're immediately ready to have sex at that point you know pretty much that's not how yeah that's not how it is for women though you know like they it is an emotional thing for them they have to be emotionally taken care of throughout the day throughout the evening and everything outside of the bedroom in order for for them to want to be able to be intimate inside the bedroom. In terms of helping out around the house, I think, you know, it it needs to go beyond that, right? It can't be like the wife telling the man what to do, like, hey, you need to take out the trash. I think it's more in terms of taking charge, right? And that's probably what uh, most guys are probably getting wrong uh by by trying to 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 listen to you and to to do these things they they think that maybe they just have to get handed a list to them of chores that they need to do and then they'll get the sex it doesn't work that way it's about knowing what right. needs to get done around the house right and a comment that you hear a lot about women is well I shouldn't have to tell them what needs to be done and it's true you live in this house don't you you know what needs to get done on a weekly basis groceries laundry you know, cleaning around the house, vacuuming, whatever, you know what it is. So something that guys ask a lot to their wives is, uh, okay, well, what do we need to do? That's not a man who takes charge. If your wife sees you doing the stuff without asking her or waiting for her to ask you to do something, then you're getting there. That's where you start creating that attraction. Oh, wow, I didn't even... I don't even have to ask my man to do things around the house. He just does it. And then she'll tell her friends and they'll all be like impressed because a lot of guys don't seem to be on the ball with that. Right. Absolutely. So one of the things that I tell people is, you know, you already have children that you're raising. The last thing your wife needs is another child, a man child, right? Like that's, that's the last thing that she wants or needs. Um, You know, as men, I mean, and it's almost like this has become controversial and I really don't understand why, but like men are supposed to be the leaders of their household, but that only works if you are a man worthy of being followed. You know, you can't be the man who is quote unquote leading your family, but you're doing it from the couch while you're, you know, watching Netflix and eating potato chips and that type of stuff. Like you you have to be, like you mentioned, you have to be that person that is actively seeking ways to not not only um, do day-to-day things, and this is where it's not just chores, training chores for sex. It's not just about the day-to-day household things, but it's about you forging a, a, a taking a vision and turning it into a reality, you know? Um, yeah, like, are you an attractive man? Are you doing attractive things? And I don't just mean physically attractive, but are you doing right. things that make you look attractive? Do you have hobbies? Do you have 
Do you spend lots of time with your kids? Your wife sees that. She sees you being a present father. Are you a present father? Are you involved in the community? Do you volunteer? Do you do sports? Do you work out? All those things will make you an attractive man and husband and father. So as a good father, that's probably one of the most attracting things to women, I think, in my opinion, is when they see a great dad. That to them turns them on. Absolutely. It's funny because, you know, men are willing to be passionate in the bedroom. And what they forget is that if you brought that same level of passion and energy to your, the things that you're doing outside of the bedroom, what would happen in the bedroom would take care of itself. You know, um, passionate about being a father and taking care of your kids, passionate about, you know, what, like you mentioned, like could be hobbies or things outside of the house or, you know, like, um, just what you do, you know, whether it's, you know, for a living or, or like for you know, like obviously you and I are both like we're online content creators. There's a certain level of passion that goes into yeah, all of these of things that we're building online. Um, you know, like my quote unquote day to day job, my nine to five, if you will, is, you know, I'm a teacher and a high school football coach. One of the first times that my wife ever said, man, I'm so freaking attracted to you right now was watching me coach a football game. And, she, and her ex, her exact words were, "I have never," and this is you know this is like before we had our kids and stuff. She's like, "I've never seen you be that passionate about anything before." Oh, by the way, I want to take you and go do you right now. You know, it was like that type <laughs> of thing, you know. And it's like you know, so there's definitely like no one is attracted to the guy who slumps around life every day who you know, goes to a job that they hate and, you know, all of those types of things. I mean, and, and that's why I think that it's such an appeal right now. Like, you know, you see people advertising online, like escape the nine to five. And it's like, it's because people hate their nine to five by and large, not everyone, but a lot of people hate what they do day to day. I do. So yeah, exactly. That, <laughs> and that's why a lot of us are here. We're trying to build something separately that maybe could eventually become the thing, you know? Yeah. And yep. so if you don't like what you do, you still have to find a way to find energy, find passion, to find that enthusiasm, um, you know, which is why we're doing like these podcasts or we create content online and all those things. Because yep. as men, we need things to be passionate about. Exactly. I fully believe that we are not fulfilling our purpose as men if we do not have things that makes our needle move every morning when we get up. And if we aren't finding those things, our wife can tell. And, and you can almost, I feel like, you know, internally, she's just like completely closing herself off to us because, you know, who wants to, who wants to be with someone like that? Yeah, dude, it's not attractive for a woman to see her husband lying on the couch, drinking beer, watching sports. It's just not. No. Who, who would want to have sex with that? Would you be <laughs> attracted to your wife if she was slumped on the couch with a bag of Doritos watching Jersey Shore or something? I don't know. Well, they're watching right. these days, but that wouldn't be attracted to you, would it? No, no, neither, neither to me. And look, I know we're men and we we pretty much ready to go whenever you want. But there's some, you know, there's some situations that are less attractive. And that, that to me, it would be one of those. So like, we got to you got to reverse that situation and think, you know, well, and there's that that trick that uh, I don't know who came up with this, but to pretend like you have like cameras around the house. And then if you had cameras around the house and you recorded yourself on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, would you be proud of what you see? And then if the answer to that is no, well, then you got work to do. Right? Yeah, so, I love that. I love that. Yeah. And you mentioned it in the course as well. Uh, it's it's To me, it's probably one of the biggest factors in how to create intimacy uh, is listening and actually actively listening to your wife paying attention to her that to me was probably the one that i, I when I, I saw it and i and i listened to it uh it it is like yeah a hundred percent so when i personally talk to my wife i'm present we rarely have the tv on uh when it's me and her at the end of the day We'll be sitting on the couch, kids are asleep, 
and it's me and her talking. And this is almost, I could say, it's probably a daily occurrence. So we have that time where we actually have a conversation. It's not necessarily a deep conversation, but if she wants to tell me about her day, then I'm there and I'm listening. My phone's not in front of my face. The TV's not on. So we're there, we're talking. It could also be having coffee and at, the, at the beginning of the day. Now we're lucky, you know, we both work from home. And so that helps to be able to have that moment where we're, we're drinking our morning coffee. Again, another opportunity for us to talk. And once again, if she's talking to me or if I'm sharing something with her, then she's got my full attention and vice versa. To me, when we've had those conversations, that's where I've noticed that after that, she was the most attracted to me. So actually listening to her and paying attention and asking questions and letting her share, I think that's one of the fastest ways to get her to bed. <laughs> and you spoke about that in your course. And I, I thought that's something that probably a lot of guys need to work on. Can you tell me a little bit more about uh, you know, you spoke, you speak about it a lot in the course, but can you tell us a little bit about how can men learn to actively listen to their wives? Yeah. So, um, one thing just quickly, and that I thought of, as you were saying that is the reason why you're seeing that reaction out of hers, because what you're really doing by actively listening is you're fulfilling the emotional part of the intimacy that she needs to get to the place where she wants to do the physical intimacy part. You know, again, it goes back to the difference between men and women. We are, we are physically driven when it comes to sex, women are emotionally driven. So by you taking the time to not just hear the words, but actually to be listening to her, that makes a huge difference. And, and, you know, not a surprise at all that that would be the times that she'd be the most attracted to you. Um, so it's just some some easy ways to be better active listeners. Um, there, there's a I can't remember where I stumbled across this, but there's a technique, and it's it's good for all aspects, like students in the classroom for connecting with your wife. But it's the slant technique, and basically, slant is an acronym, and it, and it loosely is like so. The S is like like sitting up, you know, sitting forward, like listening, like you know, having good posture. You know, like if I'm slumped back on the couch, then that's almost giving off a signal that it's like, I'm not really interested in what you have to say. Okay. Whereas if I'm like more leaning in, you know, like sitting up and then the L is leaning in. Like, so if I sit up and I'm leaning in close to you, especially as a spouse, you know, then that those are signals that tells the other person, I want to hear what you have to say. Um, and then the A is, um, it, it, it's, um something about like um like your your attitude towards the conversation so like in other words you know you're not doing things like um you know uh rolling your eyes or you know making deep breaths like moans or groans or whatever because your wife is trying to tell you about this thing because you've already heard this story or because you know it's not that important to you because it's important to her, so therefore it matters, right? So, yeah. you know, your attitude towards what you're hearing. And then um, the end is basically like you are, um, you're, it's, it's not being distracted. So that's where like, you know, you turn the TV off, you know, you get rid of the cell phones. You know, and one thing, and I, I kind of got this from you, is like, just leave the cell phone in the bedroom if I'm not in the bedroom. You know, when I'm at home and if I'm hanging out with my family in the living room, Go put your phone in the other room because it isn't that big of a deal. And then the T stands for like track, like track with your eyes. So in other words, like, you know, it, like, let's say you, you know, your wife or maybe you for that matter is like, you know, folding laundry or going to get something, you know, you would track them to where it's like, you know, you're actually tracking and watching them as they're doing stuff, you know, and not just, you know, looking at something else in the other room, whenever they're in that room talking to you, that type of stuff. And so, you know, those are all cues that helps you sort of, give off the idea that that you're interested in what the person has to say. And so that's one like quick little thing. And I learned that a long time ago. And it really does make a difference when it comes to those conversations you're having in the home. The other big thing when it comes to listening is 
the way that you structure your time at home. And so like, what I mean by that is we have a daughter who who is grown now. She doesn't live in the house anymore, but we still have conversations with her regularly between my wife and I, sometimes both of us, we'll talk to her every single day. Okay. Okay. Well, there might be times where it's like, like if she calls and we're in the middle of having a conversation, when she calls, we'll always answer. But if it's not something where it's like immediately, like there's something really going on right now, it might be, Hey, like, we'll call you back in 30 minutes or whatever, you know, like, you know, if, if as long as it's not an emergency, we're having a really good talk right now. And it's okay to say those things, you yeah. know, saying no, is there's nothing wrong with that. You know, we also have twin 13 year old boys that still live at home. And as I'm sure you can understand, it's they're rowdy and rambunctious and they want to do things and they want to like wrestle and do jujitsu and try to choke dad and wrestle and all these things. And it's like, and I love it. And whenever I'm with them, I'm fully doing that stuff. And we're, you know, giving each other power bombs and choke slams and the whole deal. But then if if my wife and I are in the middle of having a conversation, it will be a case where it's like, hey, like, hold on a second. Like, we're talking right now. Yeah. I want to hear what you have to say. I love listening. But in a minute, because right now we're talking, you know, and just normalizing those types of things, because what that does is one it, there's lessons to be learned with teaching your kids those things which we're, this isn't necessarily a parenting talk but you know that's a whole separate thing right. but then as far as like the, the from your marriage you're also you're showing your wife now that you are placing a certain level of value in what she has to say and that's very powerful you know that that shows that it matters to you and one of the best things that we can give our wives is them knowing that we care about what they have to say, you know, and and it's very easy to be like, you know, I don't care about this book that she's reading. You know what I mean? Like, it's not the type of book I want to read necessarily, but you listen because if it matters to her, then it's, it's important, you know? Um, So those are some things that I would just think of like right away. Yeah, man, for sure. And I think a lot of it comes down to, Look, do you care about your wife? Obviously, you married her, <laughs> right? You married her. You love her. You care about her. So you should care about her interests. You should be interested in what she's interested in. Not all of it. And, you know, if she knows you well enough, then there's some things she's not going she's gonna withhold and not necessarily share with her, with you. You know, if she's reading uh, some... Glamour magazine, or I don't know what. I'm not. I'm not right, in touch with right. anything. <laughs> so if she's re- she's reading whatever it is that she's reading, and and she knows you're not going to be interested in. You know, she'll she loves you, and she knows you. She'll she'll withhold. But at some point, she has to be able to share her interests with you, to at least you know, be able to talk about it because she's passionate about it. And chances are, she's probably listening to you talking about football, and. Maybe she's not that crazy about it. I mean, maybe she's a fan, but maybe she's not that big of a fan. But she's she's doing you the the favor of of listening to you and letting you talk about statistics and and this and that and sports teams and who, who's making the playoffs and who's not making the playoffs. Look, it goes both ways. You know, marriage is a two way street, and you got to be able to to compromise and and to talk to each other. And you know, I don't want to go as far as say as as pretend. Because you don't want to pretend. You don't want it to be fake. You want it to be genuine and authentic. So, and I, th- I think that's where a lot of guys uh, miss the ball is that they don't focus. That's the first thing is probably is, to me is the focus. Is your focus there? You know, is, is your phone away? Is the TV off? Are you actually listening to her? Are you making eye contact? If your wife's talking to you and you you're over there looking at you know you're glancing at the TV, what kind of signal do you think that's sending to her? Like yeah yeah I'm listening, but you know I'm just I'm I'm also looking at the game. So and you're like you're it's like you're hinting at it like, uh babe you know the game's on. Do you mind? <laughs> you know you're not right. saying that, for, you're not explicitly saying that, but it, obviously you're thinking it by showing her these cues. So. Active listening to me is something that, and it's not just in couples, but I mean, obviously this is a, it's a conversation uh, related to, to uh, relationships, but active listening to me in the, in our society is something that's like, has to be improved like tenfold. It's, it's, we're missing it all by a lot. And I see it on a daily basis. I see it with my colleagues. I see it with my friends. 
uh, people are like unable to listen to you talk for more than 30 seconds. And I don't know if it's the effects of, you know, phones and social media or, or what's going on, but people are unable to let you finish a sentence these days. I, I can't, I can barely talk to some people at work that, you know, they're going off about their vacation and like, I'm letting them talk. And, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm very good at, at active listening. That's something that I, I got down, right? Pretty, you know, and it's, it, it's, it came naturally to me. It's just, uh, I've always been that way, but I'm, people really like talking to me and, and that's fine. And they, they like to share with me. And uh, I, I, I'm very good at giving them the impression that they could keep going. And that's fine. If, if I notice that somebody needs to talk, I'll let them talk. But they very rarely return the favor. It's it's I don't know if it's you know egotistical or they they're, they're they're selfish in that way. Everybody wants to be able to tell you everything about their cat or their vacation or whatever it is their kids, but like they they can't listen to you in return. So yeah. if we're doing the same thing in our relationships, then what does that say about your couple? Absolutely. You know, it's funny because you know everything that you were talking about. That I was just thinking about like in the classroom and all the students, you know, that we, that I see throughout the course of a given day. And it's like, it's to the point where it's like, you know, you have to like change up what you're doing throughout the, like at the school that I'm at, I have kids for 50 minutes at a time. And it's like, you know, you, you can't have them do one thing for 50 minutes. That's out the window. That's not going to happen. You're lucky if you can get them to focus on one task for 10 minutes, you know, and right. you got to change it up. Otherwise they're trying to get on their phone or they're falling asleep or they're talking to the person next to them. And it, it's, it's the, um, it's the, the culture that we've created as a society anymore, where it's all about instant gratification. It's all about, you know, I want things as quickly as I can get them. You know, I mean, you and I obviously are, are online, like written content creators, Well, what's the most important part of anything that we write? It's the hook. Cause yeah. if you don't have a good hook, they're not going to read it. And that's, that's right. the way that that's the way the world is working, you know? <laughs> and so it, it makes it tough. It, it really does. It makes it for a really, um, it's, it puts a strain on, especially like the most important relationship we have, which is our marriage. You know, um, if you don't take the time to really force yourself to be present in, in the moment, it's so easy to get caught up in all the distractions because you know, we have the entire world at our fingertips on our phone, you know? Um, I mean, almost most houses these days, you know, you have Wi-Fi, and so you can access your phone, you can access the internet anywhere in your home, you yeah. can be outside barbecuing, looking at the internet, you know, you can, you know, you can be anywhere. And so it's like, okay, you know, how do, how do we sort of separate that whenever we are focusing on our marriage? Because, you know, you can't be fully present to your spouse if you are also in any way focusing on other things. You know, now my focus is being divided, you know, and, and it's not fair. Ideally, and I, and I write about this a lot, ideally your marriage should be the one thing that makes everything else better, you know, but that only happens if you take the time to really, well, really to do all the things that you promise to each other on wedding day, on, on your day of, you know, the day that you get married, yeah. it's kind of funny. Like by the time this comes out, um, this post will already be out there, but I'm working on a, a post for next week, um, where the hook is basically like marriage is a terrible idea. Dot, dot, dot. Like if you're not willing to do the things you said you were going to do the day that you got married. Nice. And, and that's so true because, you know, we pro and my wife and I, and everyone's different, my, whether you do the regular vows that, that the, the officiant reads, my wife right. and I wrote our vows. We okay. wrote our own vows. This this will tell you um, how committed my wife is to our marriage. She quoted Vince Lombardi in her wedding vows. So, <laughs> you know, as, as a football coach, like, man, I was like, man, if I didn't already know that she was the one, I know she is wow. now. But, yeah. Um, so, anyways, but whatever, you, whether you wrote your vows or you didn't, you know, you promised certain things to each other that day when you got married. And so often – whether it's one year, five years, 50 years down the road, somewhere along the way, people stop doing the things that they committed to doing that day that you got married, you know, which is why 
so many people look at the wedding day as the end. That's the finish line, but that's just the starting line. You know, that's the starting line of the journey. And so, you know, if, if you can't commit to doing the things that you said you were going to do, then don't even go down that journey. You know, don't get married if you can't do that, because um, like I said, it has the potential to make everything else better, but only if you're willing to honor those commitments. Yeah, man, absolutely. You have to be able to prioritize your wife. I mean, if not her, then then who? Right. You know? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think especially once you introduce kids, like once you start having kids, it's very easy to fall into the trap. And we were guilty of this. And obviously, you know, I've been pretty open about sharing um, like what had gone on with one of our son and, he, you know, battling cancer and everything. Yeah. And so obviously when you have stuff like that, it's very easy to fall into the trap. And even if there's nothing big like that, oh, man, I've got to be parent. You know, I've got to be parent, parent, parent. When in reality, even if you have kids, you still have to be a spouse first. Your marriage yes. still has to be first. And that's a hard lesson to learn. And it was tough for us. And to be quite honest with you, we did not do a good job of that always. And and our Neither marriage suffered I. because of it. And you yeah, talk about and, it in your course. And that's I think that's a very important point. Uh, you talk about continuing to date your wife. Mm -hmm. And that might look different to a whole lot of couples including mine, once our children were born, weekly dates went out the window. Right. That that didn't happen. And my kids are still young. They're six and four. So we're still not dating on a weekly basis like we used to. And I don't know if we're ever going to get back to that. The thing is, though, I think to me, a date can take form in many different ways. You know, a date could be like I mentioned earlier, my wife and I having coffee in the morning before work Absolutely. because the kids are already at school or daycare. And we have that like 15 minutes where we can sit down uh, you know, on the patio when it's nice or inside on the couch and have that coffee. That, that Right there, you go to a coffee shop, that's a date, right? Well, we have our coffee uh, on the patio outside in the summer and we talk. There you go. That's a date. Or when Absolutely. the kids are asleep, instead of watching TV together, which is not the most romantic thing, play a board game or something. Or just talk about your day and, and let her vent about her day. Give her a massage. People ha go have couples massages, right? That's a date. Well, give her a massage at home. There you go. That's your date. Chances are she'll be grateful. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> to Absolutely. You after that. So... I think a lot of people are using the excuse of having kids uh, in order to justify not dating their wives, right. where it doesn't necessarily have to be that way. What are your thoughts on that? So the two most common excuses, and I say the word excuse because I think they are excuses. These are not realistic reasons. The two most common excuses that I hear, because I'm pretty open, like my wife and I, go on a date where we actually leave the yeah. home every weekend. Now our boys are 13 and we have a big enough city that we live in, not a major city. It's like around 50 or 60,000 people. So good size, not huge, but big enough that there's plenty of restaurants. We can go to Walmart. We can go to Sam's club and we're with just a few minutes of our house. So our boys can stay home and, and we can leave for a couple of hours to go have lunch on the weekends and go do our grocery shopping. And and that's something we do. But I realize that not every, you know, like your kids are four and six. Obviously, you're not leaving them home by themselves. No. So now for you, for you to leave, you'd have to hire a babysitter or maybe there's a family member that can come over. And yeah. then if they don't share the same values as you, and that's another common thing that people are worried about. So kids and finances. Well, here's the thing. Prior to our kids, and we have twins, you know, when they were little, we didn't go outside of our house for those dates. We, I can't tell you how many carpet picnics we've had over the years. You know, where we'll wait for the kids, we'll get them to bed, we'll go sit in the living room on the on the floor, spread out, you know, like we're having a picnic right there on the living room floor, okay? That's another good thing. One of the other best ways, if, if you can't figure out, um, and, and that costs nothing because you're going to eat anyway, right? Yeah. You know, you're already going to have to eat dinner. Don't go to, the, to the, get food outside if you don't have a lot of extra money. That's fine. You know, there's a big time throughout our marriage where we were, we were not as financially secure is what we are now. Right. I mean, that's very common for most young couples. Sure. Um, so that's certainly fine. The other thing that, that you can do if you, if you are 
the fastest way to build in time for a weekly date, and you can even have it be a nightly date, go to bed at the same time. That's one of the fastest ways that you can make sure that you have time to spend together. The purpose of a date is not that you have to leave the house to go on the date. The purpose of the date is just to make sure that you carve out time where it is just the two of you, where your kids are not around. Exactly. Now, sometimes that might just mean that they're in the other room or that they're asleep. Or like you mentioned, after they go to school and you have your coffee, that's the perfect date. Go to bed at the same time, you know? Um, and I and I know too, there's always somebody out there that's gonna say, well, you know, my husband works the third shift and I I get that. My parents do that. My mom is also a teacher. My dad works at um, for a company that like makes like baseball equipment. He works the overnight shift, but you know what they do? He gets home at the end of his shift around the time that she's getting up to get ready for school and they talk together during that time and they have that well they my dad doesn't drink coffee because he's gonna be going to bed but my wife will have her or my mom will have her morning coffee while my dad is just sort of sitting there talking with her you know and then he goes to bed when she leaves to go to school there's always a way if you're willing to find it you know um going to bed at the same time guarantees that you are spending time without your kids around and if you really going back to the whole the, the, the intimacy and the sex talk one way you're going to guarantee yourself not to have as much sex is by not going to bed at the same time. You know, yeah. you know, if, if your wife is in bed and you're on the couch playing call of duty, you're probably not having sex at that point. You know, you got to go to bed and be in the bed at the same time, you know? Yeah. So um, yeah, the, you, you have to date your spouse. And I think, you know, I think the other thing that people get confused about is when 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 guys who are doing marriage content say don't stop dating your spouse it's not just about like physical dates it's also about like the pursuit of your right. wife you know when you were dating you did like nice little romantic things like you know leaving her a little post that hey i love you you're beautiful one of the things and my 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 boys and i mean they're around the house or somewhere they might be able to hear me i don't know but they will laugh sometimes be like oh come on dad i tell my wife she's beautiful every single day I literally look at my wife in the eyes and say, you are so beautiful every day. You know, um, I tell her that I love her all the time. You know, um, I will say things like, you're the best, you know, just little things like that. Affectionately, not yeah. just being sarcastic, but affectionately. And and there's certain like specific things that she'll do, like for me, just as a way to say, hey, like, you know, I love you, like, especially like if I go, like, let's say to a coaching clinic, almost guarantee that somewhere in my bag of stuff that I've had to pack, there's going to be like little notes in there just that I'll randomly find saying like, oh, hey, you know, think you know, when you see this, hopefully you're thinking of me, you know, like, I love you so much. I can't wait for you to be home. Stuff like That's that. Awesome. Yeah. And so when we talk about don't stop dating your your spouse, you know, it's not just about going on physical dates. It's about the pursuit and it's about the the, the environment that you were creating when you were dating, you know, and and you don't lose that. And the word that comes up in my mind, it's like what we were talking about earlier, being passionate, you know, you have to be passionate about things individually. But let's also not forget the most important thing is that you're passionate about each other. Yes, you know, complacency is can be a killer of all things, you know, like stagnation, you know, like what does stagnant water do, you know, It, it, it goes bad, you know. Um, And so, you know, if your marriage becomes stagnant, you're going to have problems. Yeah, little gestures, man, they go a long way. And uh, I agree 100% with what you're saying. Like physical intimacy, you know, people think about sex right away. But, you know, it could be holding hands, like you said. Uh, Giving your wife a hug randomly during the day for no reason whatsoever. Just grab her and give her a hug without expecting anything too. You know, a lot of guys, they, you know, they say, oh, well, maybe if I rub my wife's shoulders just for like five seconds, maybe it'll, it'll turn her on. It doesn't work right. that way most of the time. It doesn't work that way. <laughs> Let's be honest. Right. You know, so you, you got to be able to show your wife affection without a motive behind it, <laughs> which we all Absolutely. know what it is. So, you know, just holding her hand, uh, you know, sh- showing also your kids, that you love their mother. That's very important on a parenting aspect as well, you know, that for kids to see that their parents love each other. And I, I'm very much like like you. Uh, we're very similar uh, in, in my couple with my wife. 
Uh, we hug each other. We kiss each other every single day. My kids see that. Uh, and it's, it's great. They see their parents in love and, uh, you know, if that's the right message to send to them, we, we, otherwise, what do you want them to learn that it's okay to be in a couple where you're barely, the husband and wife are barely touching each other or showing each other love and affection. It, it doesn't work that way. And we don't want that for our kids. And we want our kids to grow up in a loving environment. And the first step to that is having a loving relationship with your wife. And it's it's not just about uh, about sex. It's about little gestures, like you mentioned, and helping around the house and uh, giving her attention and uh, giving her hugs on a daily basis. Uh, that sort of thing shows appreciation and she'll pick up on that and, and she'll, she'll return a favor as well. Yeah, you know, it's funny because kids are watching always. You know, they're seeing everything that we do. They're seeing how we interact with our spouse. They're seeing how we respond to conflict. They're seeing how, you know, we respond in all situations, you know, and, and every, every stage that they're in, they pick up more and more on different things. You know, one of the things that I spend a lot of time talking with my sons about is, you know, what it means to be a man and more specifically a good man, a quality man. And a big part of that is, how you treat your your wife and so not only am i working on building the bond that my wife and i share what i'm also doing every single day is i am showing my sons what their expectation should be of their future wife of their you know marriage that they'll have one day right and and it was the same with our daughter when she was at home you know i what I was showing her was what she should expect from her future husband. And now that she's 22 and she's, she's dated and, you know, these types of things, you know, those things matter. They really, really matter a lot. You know, um, the story I always like to share is that a few, a few months ago, she had called and told us like, listen, I'm not, I'm not dating. I'm not seeing this guy that I was dating anymore. Cause every time I would talk to him, he was always like either not at work when he's supposed to be, or he was late for work and all this. He's like, I can't be with someone who doesn't have a very good work ethic. And it's like, that's why we do what we do. You know, it's to, it's to, it's to build the bond for ourselves, but then it's also to be able to show our kids what is the expectation, what the standard is that they should be expecting out of their marriages. So I think it's important, like the environment that we are showing them day to day, it's so important um you know and, and i'm very open to like there are certain things obviously that are like private but you know even the conflicts even the things that aren't as good there's times where they need to see how you respond to those things you know like if we're having a disagreement or an argument and that type of stuff they need to see that we are resolving those conflicts in healthy ways you know we're not right. screaming and yelling and cussing at each other we're not throwing things at each other you know or any of those types of things and it's like you know, kids need to see that too. You know, they need to understand healthy conflict resolution. So yeah, man, I just, you know, I think um, the better the environment we can create for our kids through our marriage. Um, it's kind of funny that we're talking about this because, you know, the the name of my course, is, it's generational marriage. Right. And that's part of, that's part of the reason why, you know, people have asked me like, well, how the heck did you come up with that for a name? And so in my mind, you know, for our marriage, if, if our marriage is doing all the things that we want it to be doing, the idea behind it is it, it's going to impact the future generations of our family. So that ideally, once my wife and I are both gone, we've passed away, our future grandkids and great grandkids are still benefiting from the 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 example that we set because we set such a strong example with our marriage that those values have been being passed down the line. And so that's why um, I, I kind of looked at it as like, okay, how do you create a generational marriage? In other words, where it will impact generations after you're gone. Yeah, man, it makes a lot of sense. And uh, another big theme in your course that uh, really uh, appealed to me was the communication aspect of it, which you spent, I think, was it six or seven chapters on it uh, with the videos? And it is a huge part of, of marriage. So when you look at relationships, 
most of the time what fails is a lack of communication. And one of the things that you talk about is honesty in communication in your marriage. Now, I, to what level do people need to be honest with each other in a relationship? Because you hear about it a lot. A lot of guys don't always talk about their feelings, right? It's the macho mm -hmm. mindset of not wanting to share what they're thinking or what they're going through with their, with their wives or with anybody. But it, look, it, I can understand not sharing with your buddies. I can under I can understand not sharing with your your parents or your family. But she's your wife. If you're not gonna talk to her, then who are you gonna talk to? And if the answer right. is nobody, well, then you're you're holding all that emotion inside, and then you're gonna inevitably explode at some point. So then I think I think that's where the honesty comes in. And that's what I got from your, from your course, which, by the way, is is fire. And I recommend it to everybody. And uh, we're going to have links to it in uh, in the show notes. But uh, I, I have to say that the honesty in communication is like vital. Now, what can guys do that struggle with that in terms of sharing their feelings with their wives? What are some steps that they can take to get that going so that they could improve the relationship. Yeah. So the first part, like, you know, you would ask like, to what extent should people be honest? And my answer to that is it's an all or nothing. Like you've got to be fully honest. You know, I would even argue that every time, like, let's say your wife says, you know, like, Oh, well, like what's the matter? How are things? And you're like, Oh, everything's fine. If they're not really fine to an extent, you're kind of lying at that point. You know, you're not being honest. And so um, with that being said, you know, guys who are struggling, you know, I think I, I will say this, the point where our marriage was like at the brink of ending, it was because I wasn't being fully honest with what was going on with me. Okay. Um, you know, some of the stuff that was going on with our son, you know, I developed a lot of anger during that time to where even once he was good and he was in remission and he was recovering and doing great. I was the one that wasn't doing it because I was still left over with the anger and hostility that I had towards the world, really, which sort of manifested in me just like letting myself go, you know, mentally, physically, emotionally, all of those things. And so I, I had gotten to the point where I, I would say I was in denial. You know, I was convinced that things were going to magically work out. And so my wife was constantly trying to talk to me about what's going on? How can we fix this? And my response was always the same, you know, um, no, nah, everything's fine. You know, it's not a big deal, you know? Um, you know, and the truth of the matter is that everything was not fine and everything right. wasn't going to be fine. And so I think for anybody out there who is, is struggling with, okay, well, all right, you know, Jake, like, so you're saying we got to be honest. Well, that's not easy for me to do. Like, how do I go about that? You know, I think the first thing that you have to do is you you really, as cliche as this may sound, you have to like have a conversation with yourself first, okay? And so what that what I mean by that is, is you have to kind of decide, and it really kind of comes down to a like a draw a line in the sand kind of moment, really. What are you trying to get out of this marriage? Because the truth is, is that there's only one way that marriage is going to actually work, and that's if you're being honest. Yeah. Now. That's not to say that you can't get by, but that again, that's where you have to ask yourself, what are you trying to get out of this marriage? Do you want to just get by for the next 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years? Or do you want to have a good marriage? Because if you want to have a good marriage, you have to understand you have to be honest with your wife. And I think, you know, it can start differently for everyone, but I would say one of the first things that you need to do is just have a conversation where you start by just saying, okay, this is one thing that I'm not happy about. Okay. The, but, and I think I talk about this in the course too. The other end of that is your spouse has to be willing to receive the honesty. I talk about that a lot in the course, you know, honesty only works if both people have mutually agreed to not immediately get defensive because especially like as men, we're so guarded with our feelings if at the first sign of us opening up, our wives ridicule or belittle us or anything like that, 
yeah. we're never going to do it again. It's not yeah. going to happen. So I would say, and I, you know, I don't know how many women will listen to this versus men, but you know, for the women who might potentially listen to this, if you want your husband to be honest with you, you need to cultivate a, a, an environment where he feels safe to do so. Because if you expect your husband to open up to you, but then you take those feelings for granted in any way, it's not ever going to happen again. So yeah, maybe it's, it's some a people thing. have, maybe some guys have the impression that their wives want them to be as masculine as possible. And, you know, we see that a lot these days, you know, guys promoting masculinity, which is right. I agree with that. But maybe are some guys seeing that and hearing that and thinking to themselves, well, with that comes always being tough. And that means yeah, and what? Think, not reacting to your emotions, not sharing your emotions. That doesn't make sense to me. Yeah. And then I think the other part of that that's a struggle too is you know, you see this this promotion of like independent boss babe type stuff where you know we're gonna have these independent women and all this type of stuff. And it's like that's a bunch of nonsense too. Like women need men. And I and maybe people don't agree with that, but sorry, like that's the truth. Women need men. Yeah. And, and that's not to say that men don't also need women, but there are certain things that like, like men, the masculine, that's where the masculinity comes in. You know, you need masculine energy and women, they, they need that. And we need feminine energy from our wives too. Don't get me wrong. But, um, I do think that there it's, that's the tricky part though, is how can I be masculine while also being vulnerable? And that's not easy to do. But I do believe that I think part of it is honesty and vulnerability is not weakness necessarily. Right. It's, you know, it's, it's just, these are things that I'm struggling with, you know, um, because the truth is, and again, this goes back to what I said a minute ago, your marriage should be the one thing that makes everything else better. Okay. And I'll just use an example for myself. A couple of weeks ago, I was not in a good place with just it was a struggle you know with all the stuff that was going on with just the online like content was just not doing well some frustrations with stuff that was going on with my regular job there's just a lot of stuff that was going on okay and I was complaining about it you know I was I was like opening up and confiding in my wife now here's what she did not do she did not say oh man you know like you're a baby or just like whatever and, and that type of stuff that did not happen. She didn't devalue my feelings in any way. But here's what she did do. She did say, um, well, listen, uh, you know, to an extent, you, I think you need to suck it up a little bit. And I was like, what? And she was like, well, listen, here's the thing. You've worked too hard for too long to just throw in the towel and give up now. Here's what you need to do. You need to go sit back down at your laptop and you need to find a way to make some stuff that's better. And I was just like, what, what, what are you saying? Like, <laughs> she's like, yeah, go in there and sit back down and just find a way to make some stuff that's even better. I know you can, I've seen you do, I've seen, cause she, she reads, you know, some of what I write and stuff like that. She, she watches and sees it. She's on Twitter and everything too. Um, she's like, I've seen some of the stuff you've written. It's, it's awesome. Find a way to make more awesome stuff. And it's like, all right, I, I guess you're right. You know? And so what she did was like, she told me what I needed to hear. Yeah. And it also helped build me back up. Like, I know that you're capable of doing amazing things. Go do it. Suck it up and go find a way to do amazing stuff again. And so that's like the essence of what has to happen. Like you can't devalue each other's feelings. Yeah. But you also have to be able to tell them what they need to hear as well. And I think you just said you have to be open to that. You know, um, one of the things and kind of going back to like men struggle with opening up. You know, at our jobs, we, depending on what you do, you know, you have to be willing to go to training or you have to be willing to go, you know, do a, a course or a, a, an extended learning thing or whatever. Um, you know, like I know you work like kind of in like the, the finance field in some fashion, I believe. Right. That's right. And so like, yeah, so there's certain things you have to learn to be able to do your job effectively. And yeah. so every time you, you have to learn something, what you're really saying is, OK, I don't know enough about this right now. So if we can do that for our job or for our career, there's no reason that we can't say, hey, listen, I'm struggling with this with the person that is supposed to be the person we can be the most open with out of anyone, you know? 
Um, if you can be that open with your boss, someone who would have no problem firing you tomorrow, <laughs> then you should definitely be able to be that way with your spouse, who is this person that's supposed to be your number one person. And so I think sometimes, for, especially for us men who, you know, we can be hard headed and, you know, not want to share our feelings and all that. I think really sometimes when like we're logic driven. And so yeah. I think really we've, we've got to look at things from a logical standpoint. You know, if I can do this thing at my job for someone who I probably don't even like very much, definitely don't like as much as my wife, you know, then I should definitely be able to do it for my wife because again, you know, that's my number one person. What, what's more important than your marriage, right? Exactly. You know, exactly. It comes down to that and do it. Uh, I, I used to struggle with that too, with the honesty thing and opening up, opening up to me, like was really, uh, difficult for me, uh, as, as, as recently as a few years ago, uh, I used to, you know, have a bad day and not even talk about it at all with my own wife. And that's just, I, I, I would bottle it up and then sure enough, it, it turns into depression or burnout and then you explode and, how how is that good? You know, it's not. It's it's terrible actually. But yeah, you I mean, can... it almost cost me my marriage for sure. Yeah, there you go. And look, uh, talking and sharing is like the most basic thing that you need to do in my mind with your wife. And that's something that I was able to work on, and I've I've improved dramatically, and it's it's improved the relationship uh, in turn. So it, it goes hand in hand. And you talk about it a lot in your course. And I have to say, honestly, uh, it, it's, it really is for everyone. You know, it's, it's not just for people that think that they might struggle in their marriage, but also for people that, are, that know that they're doing well, but maybe they think, like, like me, maybe there's something in there that I could use. And that's exactly what I found by going through your course, man. And uh, I, I commend you on that 100%, a really well-written course. Uh, I like how it was very succinct and with videos and present uh, presentations and the worksheets too. So very well crafted. So congratulations on that. And uh, let us know, uh, Jake, where can people find it? And also what can they expect by getting your course? So, um, so in a nutshell, the course is, it's not quite two hours with a video, which is also the, the presentation stuff too. Um, you mentioned the worksheets. There's six, I think six like handouts where like couples can go through them together to kind of like take what's in the course and then start like tailoring it to what they could do within their own individual marriage. Um, and so uh, that part I think really makes a difference because it's not just hearing what some random guy has to say, but then also, you know, tailoring it to your own individual marriage. Um, the easiest way to find it, if you if you go and find Dad Dynasty on um, on Twitter X now, um, it's it the in my profile. It's the link that's in there is the course. Um, you can go through the link and find it that way. Um, and then once you click on that, there's also the option of the community that we mentioned earlier, which is um, it's like a monthly membership. The way I describe that to people it is like for cheaper than the cost of a monthly Netflix Netflix subscription. You can go into this marriage community where you get access daily to me, to my wife and other married, you know, men and women um, where you can talk about successes, but also probably more valuable. You can talk about like current struggles that you're going through. You can get perspective from not just other men, but also other women. So like if you're a husband struggling, you know, you could talk to a group of men about it. You can also go pose it in the couple's chat room and you can get opinion from from wives and, you know, give feedback on maybe how you could handle that situation a little bit better. And so I personally like I'm excited about that, the, the course and the community, because I don't really see anyone else doing much that's like similar yeah. to that. And so I'm really happy and excited about that. Um, and so, yeah, you know, if you go and find dad dynasty on x it's the link in a profile and you can go from there um and it's uh i, I i'm very proud of it i it's um you know it, it's something that was like from the beginning of creating the account that's kind of where i was headed and so now that it's out there you know i'm excited to kind of share and 
promoted and and, and hopefully like like you kind of you mentioned for me whether you're uh, not married yet a newlywed or you've been married for 50 years there's something that you can find in there that you can pull yeah. out and get value from absolutely jake thank you so much for joining me on the as of mics man